there's a kind of um, skepticism, almost cynicism, certainly weariness in the American view of the Middle East now. We've had it. We've been there forever. Nothing ever goes right. Uh, the Arab Spring was a failure. Let's just forget about it. If we need allies in fighting terrorism, take them where they are, forget about it. I think that's all wrong, and I think it would be a huge mistake for the United States to give up on human rights and democracy in the Arab world. And the book is really an argument that we should not do that. There are people struggling for their rights and for democracy, and they deserve our help. And it's in our interest to help them. There's two terms to think about here, the Islamist advantage and the security dilemma. The Islamist advantage is the idea that they have this huge advantage when you move into an open democratic political system and they're gonna win. They're always gonna win. The security dilemma is, well, if they win, what happens if terrorism then starts to build and spread and extremists, Islamist extremists, take over? And I argue in the book that, yeah, they do have an advantage when after a dictator you open the political system because usually these dictators crush, not them, they crush the center, the liberals, the Democrats, the seculars, the human rights people. Uh, so who's able to organize the Islamists in the mosques? And they do have an advantage for a while, but it disappears because, you know, they do not have any magic answers. And once they get responsibility for power and people say, I thought I'd have a better job. I thought life would be better. The advantage disappears. I try to give a, a bunch of lessons at the end of the book, trying to be very pragmatic about, well, what do we do? What do we actually do? It's all very nice in theory, but what do you do tomorrow? And I think there are lessons here in the way we use our foreign aid, for example, um, in the way we structure the State Department. One lesson certainly is this has got to start at the top. You know, if the spokesman for the State Department comes out someday and, and, and issue, gives the press a press release, that doesn't have any impact on these governments. It's got to really be the president, the vice president, the secretary of state. That's who they listen to. I think that's one of, the, one of the critical lessons. I think another critical lesson here is it isn't enough to support very nice uh, NGOs in the capital cities. We like those people. You know, there are kind of people. They're for human rights and democracy uh, and labor rights and women's rights, and they all speak English, and they know how to do accounting and booking, and they probably went to school in the US. But their reach in their own societies is very often quite limited. Capital city, yeah, but outside and in the countryside, not much. So what do you do about that? Well, you know, this is called politics. I mean, it's political parties that have to organize and do the outreach to the whole country. So we should be trying to help people who are forming political parties. Because in the end, you know, this is about power. This is about governing. It's not just about an NGO. It's about fighting for power to make peaceful political change. Um, I, I think that what's, what I'm really arguing in the book that's a bit new is we're all for this as a kind of moral case. I'm arguing it's quite realistic. And if you, if you want to call yourself a realist, then you ought to be willing to acknowledge that American support for dictators is in the end a losing game. These dictatorial regimes, these tyrannical regimes, rule by brute force. And sooner or later, they're going to fall. The answer to Islamist movements is not more police. Yes, if somebody's a jihadi and he's shooting at you, you've got to shoot back. In the short run. In the longer run, they're making an argument about Islam and about society. You have to answer that argument. Policemen don't answer that argument. Soldiers don't answer that argument. Political parties with ideas can answer that argument and fight back peacefully. That's the way to win the fight in the long run. I think the book teaches 
two things. The first is uh, don't give up. Don't give in to skepticism, cynicism, pessimism. The history of the expansion of democracy is not linear, you know. It's ups and downs and ups and downs. So the fact that the Arab Spring failed in most places except Tunisia should not lead us to say, forget it, it's hopeless, you don't know, you don't understand, just walk away from it. Um, we should be more committed to human rights and democracy and more optimistic about the medium term and long term possibilities. And I think the book also, also teaches that's a realistic, a more realistic attitude. If we leave these countries as really repressive, tyrannical societies, what that's going to produce is more and more jihadis, more and more terrorism aimed at us. So from a security point of view, it's important for us to realize opening those societies, having more respect for human rights and democracy is actually a formula for defeating the jihadis, defeating the terrorists. It's a realistic proposal for protecting American security. It's not just idealistic. It is idealistic, but I would argue it's also a far more realistic approach.